Happy New Year, Tommy. Happy New Year, Dad, and everybody listening and watching this podcast. And、uh, farewell to 2021 because it's been the best of times and it's been the worst of times. That's an interesting way of saying dumpster fire, but that's <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> There have been some really great cars this year, Tommy. Surprisingly great, and there have been some surprisingly bad cars.、Uh, and in this end of the year show, we're going to be talking about the ten best and worst cars that we drove this year. So, how do you want to do this, dude? Do you want to talk about the best first or the worst first? I think we talk about our top ten highlights that we drove, and then after that, we'll talk about some of the disappointments of the year. Okay, I like that. Yeah, highlights and disappointments. We're sugarcoating it. There you go. All right, now you got to do a little bit of sugar coating in today's environment. I think, Dad. All right, and if you're watching this as a podcast、um, on our TFL Talk Channel,、uh, you will see over Tommy's shoulder a certain Jeep that is number ten on our best list. What Jeep is that, Tommy? It is the Wrangler, but not just any Wrangler. The 392. We drove this vehicle back in April of this year. And this thing is an absolute beast. How can you not like a Wrangler with 470 horsepower? Yeah, you know, people have been、uh, hemi swapping Jeeps for a long time, and I think with the Bronco coming,、uh, and that'll be farther on our list. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge, wink, wink.、Uh, I think Jeep was forced to step up their game、uh, and actually do a factory hemi swap. Oh, it's such a cool vehicle. I mean, even if you don't like Jeeps, even if you are not a big fan of the brand, just the idea that they suck 6.4 liters worth of Hemi power into a Wrangler with solid axles that really isn't all that big is just one of those things that should make the car enthusiast in you smile. It's like the last of the breed of the true muscle car, where you take something that shouldn't have a big ass V8 and you stick a big ass V8 into it. And you know what, Tommy? You know they did it right. You know、uh, we've actually driven in the past.、Uh, Hemi swap Jeeps.、Uh, our local dealership, which is now gone, Pollard, which was bought、uh, by what's the name of the new one? Fowler. Fowler.、Uh, back in the day, they actually used to do this. And I remember I went and checked out、uh, them actually doing the Hemi swap for you know their Wrangler. And I asked them. I said, "What do you guys have done? What have you guys done with the brakes?" And they kind of looked at me like I was crazy. I was like, "Wait, you put, you know." Like tons more horsepower, and I think they were actually Hellcat swapping it at the time, right? So they they did a Hellcat version. I、yeah. think, but wasn't that before Hellcat? Because Hellcat was introduced in 2015, and this was like in 2012. So what they were doing, I remember this distinctly, because I was just a middle schooler, and I thought this was、mm. the coolest thing. They they were taking the 5.7 Hemi's,、yep. and then the big Hemi's too, which I think they were using initially the 6.1 liters and putting them into the JK Wranglers. And at that time, we were looking at like 426 horsepower, and that was just like my Numbing power in a Wrangler, but they didn't change the brakes, Tommy. Which you know, if you're any kind of、uh, truck or car manufacturer, you will know that you know if you up the horsepower, you also need to up the stopping distance, especially if you're increasing the weight of the vehicle.、Uh, the cool thing is the Jeep did this right. You know, not only did they、uh, not just you know shoehorn a bigger engine into it, but they did very thoughtful things like give you a little I call it the raccoon button, which changes the exhaust note from soft to Watch out! I'm gonna get a ticket loud. It was just insane. Yeah, I mean, look, I think that saying that they changed the platform for the power is generous. I mean, I really, from a ride and handling standpoint, they they didn't do enough to make the thing ride and handle like a modern vehicle. What you'd expect, and I just love that. I love when you get on the throttle, the whole thing, like you can feel the whole frame just like cock to the right as the engine tries to break free of its wait, mounting. Wait, wait, my, my whole argument was they, they engineered it right. And no, my I, I disagree. They just they just hooniganed it. Yep, I I love the、they、Jeep guys. It. <laughs> it's it's got a full warranty. You know, it's、yeah. not like dangerously engineered, of、right. course. But I just love the fact that it's just. So bizarre. The axles, I think, are underaxled. The brakes, I think, are underbraked. Are, are they Dana forty fours? Yeah. It's、uh, a lot. Four hundred seventy horsepower is a lot of power. They well, they did well, beef well, them up right, a little bit. All right. Look, here's the thing. If you keep the standard tires, right,、mm-hmm. you're fine. But the thing is, like, we have a friend who immediately put forties、uh, on, right? Because now you've got all that horsepower that can actually. And torque that can actually move a Jeep with forties on it. So yeah, you're probably right. I mean, now you get the power plant, but 
what happens is everything downstream of the power plant starts to break when you actually upgrade the tires and wheels, especially if you go to like 40s, which people can do now. Well, from the factory, it, you can also get the new Extreme Recon package. Which gives, which you, gives 35. you 35. Yeah. I don't mean to say it's badly engineered. Right. I think that from like the stu- the boring stuff that they need to do on paper, like the cooling system, right? And the safety structures, that was all done brilliantly. I, I mean, but we, the fact that the whole thing, I mean, it is almost alarming when you hit the throttle on that going over a bump. It's like the whole thing just jiggles and shakes it's like driving a 1968 camaro with an engine that is way too big for the platform it's just fantastic i love it all right I, we, we will agree to disagree i think they actually went to a lot of effort to make sure that it was well engineered but it's one badass jeep uh, and right now it's the top kind of apex predator out there if you're off-roading until uh the bronco uh, raptor comes around and speaking of the bronco uh, let's talk about that because that's number nine on our list. Uh, I think the Bronco uh, Four just nailed it out of the ballpark in a lot, lot of interesting ways. First and foremost, I think they got that blend of retro and modern just right. And that's, I think, what makes it such a, a popular vehicle because people see the direct connection to the first generation Broncos, right? It tugs at your heartstrings and yet it's modern. And then what they did was a benchmark Jeep Tommy and I think they out Jeeped Wrangler in a lot of ways, right? So instead of having, uh, you know, traditional solid axles in the front, they made it independent suspension. Uh, They gave it a 10 speed, mind you, automatic, um, you know, a couple more gears than the Wrangler has. Uh, they actually made it a little bit more roomier uh, and made it more comfortable. Uh, they actually, you know, put all the buttons in kind of one place. So if you want to lock your rear locker or if you want to disconnect your sway bar, it's all just up on top there. We have one, of course. I just think uh, it's a very solid vehicle. And, you know, ours has been great until this week when we noticed that there was some oil on the ground here in the garage. And what happened? Because you were the one who did that video. Well, we are still waiting to hear back from the dealer, but it appears to be leaking out of one of the front struts. Mm. But I think you are 100% right on your analysis of the Bronco. They really brought their A-game with this vehicle, and they really did bring it to Jeep in a lot of ways. I also uh, think that the the pricing is right. The trims are good. The uh, the Sasquatch package was brilliant, how you can get that across the board. I love that it's got more standard features, like standard air conditioning across the board, standard power windows compared to the Wrangler. So they really did up uh, up the ante a little bit. And the seven-speed manual with a crawler gear, I mean, that's such an enthusiast choice. First of all, who's buying manual transmissions in 2021? Um, well, other than the people maybe listening to this podcast. And then to go ahead and like incorporate a crawler gear into that, that is just berserk. Really cool stuff. And what makes it so cool is that we did compare it to a Wrangler 4xe and, of course, the Defender off-road. Uh, and it did really well, Tommy. It, it didn't put a wheel wrong. You know, I'd, you'd be hard-pressed to choose between a Wrangler and a Bronco off-road. They're both capable. Uh, obviously, the Defender isn't in the same category as, as those two, at least not the one we tested. Maybe if you get the 90 and you, you know, upgrade it. Uh, but from the factory, uh, it's as good in every possible way as a Wrangler. And on the road, I think it's more comfortable. So the next vehicle on our list, moving to number eight, the brand new 2022 Volkswagen Golf GTI, the eighth generation of Golf. They did a really good job with this little car, especially considering the MSRP. So 241 horsepower, 273 pound-feet of torque, starting under 30 grand. Hey, you put this list together. Can I uh, do a Roman rant at the end of this? Uh, I've got a rant I've been I've been sitting on now for entire week. Are you okay with that? If at the end I give you a rant. Well, I mean, is it going to be a crotchety rant or is it going to be a... <laughs> is it going to be crotchety? No, it's not going to be crotchety. It's going to be it's going to be insightful, uh, meaningful, and I think it's going to resonate with our viewers and listeners. Are you good with that? I am good with that. Okay. However, let me finish the merit of the Golf GTI. The, uh, the brand new 8th generation really is a ton of power in a small but still usable package, four doors, uh, 241 horsepower in the Golf GTI for under 30 grand. I mean, that really is the highlight for me. Still get a manual transmission, fantastic little manual transmission. I love this little car. I think that the design is a little droopy, especially in the front end, and like the, the fog lights may be a little weird, but for the most part, from a driving dynamics, it's it's got plenty of um, zip in the corners. It's got you know pretty pretty flat cornering capability as well, without compromising ride quality. I really loved driving this car. Now, what is your rant? 
I'm going to do it at the end of this. Oh, at the very at end. At the very end, yeah, yeah. Well, you're going to make people wait for the rent. Yeah, we're going yeah, to have to mm. wait for the Roman rent. Um, I agree with everything you said. We got to drive it uh, through the mountains of, uh, well, we were in Charlotte, right? Just uh, outside of Charlotte. I think so. Yeah, Asheville. Asheville, Asheville that's Yeah, right. just outside of Asheville. It, it was a dream to drive. The only, uh, you know, issue I had with it was the infotainment. VW has gone with a touch interface that you can now get in the uh, ID4, uh, and it's slow, laggy, and in fact, uh, it's um, painful enough to use that it would keep me from buying the GTI. So, you know, on some of these vehicles we disagree, uh, and it, it, it hurts me to say this, but uh, as much as I love the car dynamically, uh, the infotainment in the car is so um, so painfully uh, slow and unintuitive it would keep me from you know signing a check to buy the car i completely agree the lack of the volume knob is pretty infuriating we also we were driving this car working on navigation and like i would get stuck in menus where there were no back buttons and i'd have to like go back to a home page it was really a fairly frustrating experience to to play with however i still think that volkswagen has kept the essence of the gti oh, hell yeah. in an era where everything is crossovers right and everything has to ride at least eight inches off the ground having a fresh new look at the volkswagen Golf without having it, you know, um, <laughs> sit in a crossover form is a very cool thing here in the U.S. Now, I'm going to disagree with you on number seven. Um, you tell them, you put this car down. I'm going to give you a different one, but go for it. Number seven. So I drove the new Mercedes EQS, and this is the all-electric Mercedes flagship sedan. Uh, granted, it does look like a doorstop. Maybe a little bit of Irish spring bar of soap in there. It is it not. Looks, a, it looks like a jelly belly. It's not an attractive car from the outside. However, I, I drove the AMG version. Yeah, so you drove the AMG 53. I drove the 450 and the 580. This is one of the most incredible ride and handling um, calibrations I've ever experienced. The just pure silence you get when driving this EQS. It's almost disconcerting how quiet it is. And then you've got some of the engineering stats, like over 300 kilowatts worth of regen capability, which is when you let off the throttle, the electricity goes in the back of the battery. It was plenty quick. You've got that crazy rear wheel steering, something like 11 degrees on the cars that I drove. Just a beautiful thing to drive. It kind of feels like what I'd expect an American car to feel like in 1960s, except it doesn't fall apart. Um, and it's, um, you know, it's it's not made out of so so here's used, here's my soda issue, cans. here's my issue with the EQS. Um, there's this thing that's happening, and Tesla started it, uh, and it's become a thing in the industry, and that is technology for the sake of technology. Um, so I'll give you an example of well, actually Tesla didn't start it, but like like pop out door handles. There's no need for pop out door handles. I know they're more aerodynamic, and so for an electric car, you're probably going to get what an infant you know an unobtaining amount of more range because the door handles make the car slicker and you know just give it that little bit better uh, coefficients of uh, drag. But you know what? In the winter when they freeze or when they break, it's not worth the amount of like extra range you're getting, which probably comes down to less than, you know, a quarter of a mile to have pop out door handles. The same thing with, uh, you know, the Germans reinventing the uh, transmission knob, right, or switch or button or whatever the heck it is. This is just technology for the sake of technology. And this car represents that to me. I'll tell you why. First of all, you can't open the hood which to me is like forever you could open the hood uh, and it kind of made you feel like this is, you know, you buy a car, the engine is under the hood, so you kind of felt like you could work on it, you could see what's underneath it, and when you can't open it, I'm like, why? Why not put a frunk in there? Why not let me see what's under the hood? You have to have a special key, only the dealer can open it. It feels like a McLaren, which is kind of does the same thing, but it's not a McLaren. I'm like, just Mercedes, just open the hood. Secondly, it's got this massive hyper screen, right, which is actually like one of the largest pieces of glass in automotive-dom uh, with three different screens. Uh, I couldn't even figure out, and I gave up, on how to turn on or off the passenger screen. Once again, like technology for the sake of technology. Uh, uh, and it just seemed like it was overly complicated and super fussy. And, you know, I would get the other car I drove on that program all day long, which is a new SL. So the new SL is obviously a vehicle that, you know, harkens back to Mercedes's great gullwing car back in the 50s. Uh, and the new one, uh, they've gone from uh, kind of a, I would say, old man cruiser to a young man performance convertible. It's really good. It's almost like a GT car. I don't know how the, how they're going to differentiate differentiate the SL from the GT version of the, you know, of the same car basically. Uh, but I, I'd go for that all day long. So, coming from a standpoint of someone yep. who has four cars, three of which don't have power windows, okay. <laughs> one of which has a crank start. Yeah. I love old school simplicity, 
But when I got into the EQS with 56 inches of hyperscreen, yeah. like that just, that took my breath away. That right there is the Jetsons car. You know, it's just, it's got two navigation processors. It's got, you can swipe your hand back to open the sunroof. I mean, it's, it's perhaps a little overdone. Technology for the sake of technology. But it's cool. It's just, you feel uh, like you are driving an actual spaceship. I mean, it almost doesn't feel real that like, I mean, when you, you can go you buy have, this car. Dude, when you have to redesign where you pour the windshield wiper fluid, like it's got this little, um, a tab on the side that you hit and then this little like spigoty thing opens up so you can pour windshield wiper fluid into it because you can't get into it from the hood. It just, it just, it's just once again, you're making things complicated unnecessarily just because you want to make them seem modern and futuristic. What are you going to do under the hood of your $120,000 S-Class anyways? Uh, the I'm just going to stare at that magnificent AMG. The I magnificent drove the AMG. The, engine yeah, cover. Yeah. The black piece of plastic just looking at you. You can pull that off. No. I, I, I appreciate the sentiment coming from perhaps like a 1970s Cuda, yeah. right, where you see this beautiful orange Hemi. But on modern cars, you open up the hood, you can't fix anything, and you can't see anything, so might as well just seal that puppy shut. All right, let's keep going. Number six, uh, the Toyota Mirai. That's an interesting choice, Tommy. Like I said, you came up with this list. Uh, beautiful car. Uh, it channels this inner Audi, of course. Uh, so to me, it's very reminiscent of like the old S5. Um, I would say if for all of you who don't know what a Mirai is, which probably is a lot of you because they only sell them in uh, California. Uh, it's a hydrogen-powered Toyota. It's the second generation of the Mirai. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a fuel cell vehicle. And the biggest issue, of course, is the lack of availability of hydrogen. Uh, I think there's something like 50 stations in California. Uh, and people have bought them. Uh, both the Mirai and, of course, the uh, Nexo, right, which is Hyundai's version of it, have, have actually uh, been very disappointed because, uh, well, you did a video, it was very popular on how difficult it can actually be to fuel up uh, a hydrogen car, um, which is weird because you would think that with electricity it takes a lot longer. With hydrogen, it's basically, you know, very similar to fueling up a traditional car with gas, except now you're filling it up with real gas as opposed to liquid gas. Uh, but um, yeah, until actually Toyota or any of the manufacturers commit to building out the infrastructure for hydrogen, I think it's, it's dead in the water. A thousand percent correct. And I still don't care. Okay, fair enough. Hydrogen is a technology that's been 20 years away for the last 70 years. <laughs> and yes, maybe it'll never happen. But the Mirai is one of those vehicles that you just have to appreciate exists. It's a little underpowered. So think about this, right? It's yeah. based on the Lexus LS platform. Yes. So it is like the ultimate in the Toyota Lexus Group luxury platform, rear wheel drive. And when you stop and think about what's going on as you drive seamlessly and silently down the road, I mean, it just boggles your mind. It's got a hydrogen fuel stack in the front that's taking hydrogen from three tanks at 10,000 PSI, combining it with oxygen in the air that is blown over um, incredible filters to make sure it's 100% pure. It's purifying the air as you drive along. Uh, hydrogen oxygen creates water. Distilled water comes out of the tailpipe. The result of that chemical reaction is electricity, which propels you down the road. Like, the technology behind this is space-age stuff, and you would never know from driving it. It just looks like a beautiful uh, luxury sedan that's powered by the future. And I completely agree. There's only 40-some hydrogen stations in the entire U.S. It may never expand. Hydrogen's expensive, although they do give you, like, 15 grand worth of free hydrogen. But just the, the idea that you can have all this tech cruising down the road seamlessly in a beautifully made cocoon of luxury. It's just so cool. Now, you know, I, I, the reason I disagree with you on this is because there's just a lot more uh, and better Toyotas that came out this year. Now, of course, we're not talking about trucks here, so forget about the Tundra. But how about the 86, Tommy? Paul took that on the track, fell in love with it, just thought that they knocked it out of the ballpark. Uh, you know, they took the car that was kind of a very popular enthusiast car, and they actually gave it some mid-range torque, uh, and they styled it so that it's, you know, much more modern, uh, a really great, like, weekend track or and or uh, autocross car. Why wouldn't you put that on the list? Because that'd be my, that'd be me at least. First of all, I didn't drive it. Yeah. And second of all, but we drove it as a company. Second of all, yeah. I mean, this is like this is one of those cars that's not going to sell much. Right. And maybe hydrogen will, will lapse in the history. But the fact you can buy this, do they shoot bullets at the gas tank of a GT86? <laughs> no. Probably not. But the <laughs> at, least Mirai, not, at least not in America. Maybe exactly. The, the fuel <laughs> cell testing that has to go through to make this safe. It's just like an, one of the engineering <laughs> wonders of the world. Both this and the Nexo. It's incredible mm -hmm. stuff. And I just, I just love it from 
a scientific standpoint. Whether or not it'll it'll actually succeed one day, I don't know. But the fact that you can have uh, the Enterprise powering your vehicle as you cruise along, so cool. Well, uh, we can disagree on this one. I, I'd probably put 86 on there. I can think of a bunch of other Toyotas. Actually, even the Corolla Cross. I know it's kind of a boring little crossover, but uh, man, it just hits that segment that is really popular right now. Toyota has a way of kind of figuring out you know, what is popular and, you know, what people are going to buy. It's a little, it's not one of the best cars, but I bet you the new Corolla Cross is just going to knock it out of the ballpark in terms of sales. Anyway, but let's would, would this, would the Corolla Cross purify your fart if you farted? <laughs> no, it would it? not purify. This would literally purify a fart to make it 100% pure air for the fuel And you stack. can't drink what comes out of the exhaust. On a, well, I did actually. On a, on, a, on a Corolla Cross, but you can on the right. You can on the right. It's like pennies. It's not recommended. No, if you add essential <laughs> minerals because it's distilled water that comes out. It's kind of, we drank it, right? It kind of tastes like... Uh, it tastes like pennies. It tastes like metal, yeah. yeah, yeah. There's no nutrients or anything. All right, it. let's talk about Genesis. I think Genesis is, Hyundai, Genesis, Kia, they're all doing super well right now. Uh, and so uh, you've put the GV80 on this list. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, they've kind of redefined that crossover uh, by making it sexier. By once again, you know, this is what Hyundai and Genesis do, uh, as well as Kia. They, 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 they have a unique and interesting design language. I think the cool thing about the Genesis GV80 is it looks modern without being like, you know, if, if you make something look too modern, um, let's pick an example of that. Um, it tends to look weird, like mm. maybe the new Beaver Grill on the BMW. Over time, people may come to like that, but right now, it's certainly drawing a lot of hate. But the GV80 is, you know, beautiful and timely and modern uh, and affordable. With I, I was driving through California on a Porsche program, and there was a GV80 driving next to me, and I just couldn't help but like stare at it, like it was. You know, like I was looking at a movie star. It was is that, that gorgeous. Is that because Tiger Woods drove it off a cliff? No, I think was that the eighty or was that the did you <laughs> the eighty or did you do the seventy? I, I think that was the eighty. Sorry, is that is that too soon? <laughs> That's probably too soon. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so Tiger Woods aside, yeah. you nailed this analysis stat. It starts at about forty nine thousand dollars, right? But when you consider it competes with like a BMW X five, Porsche Cayenne kind of size vehicle, we're talking sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollar cars. It's just incredible. And if you get an expensive one, you're into the seventies with the Genesis. But then you get crazy tech like a 3D instrument cluster, three-dimensional. Um, and it's not like the Nemo 3Ds from 20 years ago where you put on like red and blue goggles and then you can't see for the next three hours. It's an actual 3D instrument cluster you just look at. Really impressive technology. It's just so much better than its competition for, in some cases, tens of thousands of dollars less. It feels well made. One of my issues, though, one of the reasons I'd have a hard time buying one is the dealer network just isn't quite as built out as perhaps some of its other competition from yeah. Lexus and BMW and that. Yeah, people, people, people know what a Lexus is. They certainly know what an Acura is. They don't know what a Genesis is. And the steering wheel does kind of look like a pillow. It's a yeah, little weird. It looks like Stuart from Family Guy. <laughs> Stewie. <laughs> Stewie, it looks like his head. Yeah, you're right. That's so funny. <laughs> But still, an incredible car, super comfy, just love it. All right, let's keep going down this list. Uh, we love this car so much that we bought it, the Mini Cooper SE. Uh, mm -hmm. It's the electric Mini. Uh, they took the powertrain basically out of the uh, i3. They flipped it around, made it front-wheel drive instead of rear-wheel drive. Uh, the downside, of course, is it only has 114 miles of range. But, you know, as a city car, I don't think there's any car that is more fun than that. It is the essence of what a Mini should be. It's zippy, it's darty, it's fun, it's fast. Uh, and, you know, we've had it for, what, three months now? Now, four months, put like 4,000 miles on it. Uh, and if you're driving around town with it uh, and you can charge it at home at night, in other words, your house is your gas station, uh, it works perfectly fine. It doesn't ex actually like set any bars, you know. I mean, charge rate yeah. is only 50 kilowatts, right? Mm -hmm. The battery is how many kilowatt hours? It's like 36 or something. Yeah, it's not a lot. Um, zero to 60 is probably in the seven to six second range. But as a mini, uh, and it's a darty, fun, and fast, and kind of like a, you know, like like a piece of jewelry or or, or an interesting, uh, I don't know what's a good analogy, sport coat that you'd wear to show that you're not, you know, the usual guy out there or gal out there. Uh, it works really well. I love it. I really enjoy driving it. It's kind of like the, the Mirai, where on paper it just doesn't work. 114 miles of range, not enough. 50 kilowatt charging compared to modern days, not enough. However, when you consider it starts at under 30 grand, it applies for the full $7,500 tax credit. You could out, you know, net out the door be, you know, low 20s. And for a while, there was the cheapest electric car you could buy. It still might be. 
The leaf might be cheaper. I think the leaf is cheaper now. I was just I was doing the math in my head. I think the leaf they just the dropped is, the price on the leaf. The leaf is kind of a toaster. This car is incredibly fun to drive. Like genuinely, I know the people... leaf is the leaf is like a Walmart toaster. Ooh, Walmart toaster. Yeah. I don't know what that means. That means it's the generic toaster of toasters. You buy it looking at someone's inappropriate butt crack hanging no, out in no, the. No, no, it's just it's <laughs> like, just, what does it's, that just mean? it's just generic as it gets. <laughs> like it's like you know because you could go like to high end. Food stores and buy really cool toasters, right? Okay, so this this right here is your Bed Bath and Beyond toaster. This is the deluxe toaster. The <laughs> this mini. is the the, the Delonghi of toasters. Huh? Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> fantastic little car to drive though. It's it's one of those cars you just got to go to your dealer and drive one, and then you're they're probably sold out. Do you know that? Well, I talked to the mini people. They're true. sold out for like four months. That's a bummer. But uh, beg, borrow, or steal one and just drive it around the block, and you'll be sold on it. Yeah, it's one of those cars that uh, I think uh, there's a small group of people who appreciate them. It's not uh, well known how just how fun and good it is. Is, and hopefully we're getting the word out there because for the money it's great. I think what keeps people from buying it obviously is a the range. They're like, oh my god, only 114 miles. Uh, yeah, I mean, is it your primary car? Probably not. But is it a great second car? Heck yeah. Or in our case, like a tenth car. Anyway, <laughs> let's keep going. And I couldn't agree with you more. We're agreeing a lot on this. Uh, you've got the Hyundai Elantra. Uh, Veloster slash Kona N line. Uh, uh, you know, uh, gosh, you know. Hyundai took a page out of the German book and stole, you know, the designer or borrowed or begged or brought over the designer from Audi. Then they stole, that's, of course, Peter Schreier. Then they took uh, the M guy from BMW, Albert Biermann, uh, and now they threw it all together to make what is, uh, I think, uh, the standard for the hot hatches out there. Uh, uh, you know, they're just really fun uh, and I would say, you know, the essence of a hot hatch to me is, right, the car's got to be affordable. It's got to be kind of bad, you know what, in terms of trying to pull the wheel from your hands because there's so much torque going through the front wheels. And it's got to be kind of youthful uh, and fun and basically uh, everything in some ways that the GTI isn't, right? The GTI has become very grown up and very uh, sophisticated and well-mattered. These end cars are just a hoot to drive. You just, you just, uh, which one did you just drive? Well, so what I wanted to say really quickly yeah. is um, there's there's two things going on here. Yep. So there's the full blown N, which right. is what you're talking about. Right, I'm talking about. 270 plus horsepower. I'm talking about the one that Paul just drove. Yeah, I mean, those are incredible, right? Yeah. They have the N grin shift oh, you, button. Oh, you like the N line. You put the N and the N line. I like the N line, yeah. Mm. So, you know, we're talking BMW M3. And then like BMW M340, right? Right. So this is just a standard Elantra that's been kind of zipped up a little bit. But I thought we had the M line at the office. It's got the 1.6 turbo with 200 horsepower, so 70 horsepower less. It's like the SI versus a Type R. Exactly. But the N line, twenty-four thousand dollars, manual transmission. It was an absolute blast of a car. I absolutely loved it. And, and that's not even the full blown N. This is like the mid twenty affordable one, whereas the N starts at like thirty one or thirty two. Um, um, but I just love all of them. They did such a good job with bringing affordable performance into um, a, a daily driver. It's kind of like the the Golf GTR philosophy, Golf GTI philosophy a little bit, but really, really well executed. So here's a fun game we could play. Which one would you buy? Let me describe them. So the Veloster came out first, right? The mm -hmm. N. I'm yeah. talking about the N, not the N line now. That's a three door hatchback, which is weird but cool. Yep. Right. It's got two doors on one side, actually four door if you count the hatchback. But anyway, on one side. Uh, we drove it like three years ago, and it's kind of plasticky, and the interior is not the best. It's got the great engine. It's got the good transmission, right, dual clutch, but it doesn't have – you can also have a manual, but it doesn't have the kind of the interior. Now, the Elantra uh, has a much nicer interior. Um, and same engine, of course. And, of course, it's got that little N button, like reminiscent of the M button on the BMWs where you can actually set your preferences in terms of, like, suspension and chassis. No, I'm sorry, uh, transmission tuning. And then it's got that little other button. What does that other button do? What's it stand for? Where it gets you, like, 10 more horsepower? Yeah, the n -grin shift button. Yeah, yeah, so you get 10 more horsepower. So then there's the Elantra four-door sedan. Uh -huh. And then now the Kona, which is a four-door hatchback, right? I got to drive that like two months ago in California. Uh, and that's a hoot too. That one's the most practical of them, right? Because you can get four people and their stuff in that one. So would you go for the Veloster? Would you go for the Elantra, which is a sedan? Or would you go for the crossover? Well, I was talking to Paul, our race yeah. car driver. He loved driving the Kona N. But personally, I just don't love the SUV 
aspect of it. Okay. I, I don't need a little crossover SUV, so the Kona N would be right out. Now, when you compare the Veloster N to the Elantra, Veloster starts at 32.5, the Elantra starts at 31.9, and I would probably go with the Elantra. I think the Veloster looks a little bit cooler, and I do like the hatchback, but that interior really is a bummer, and the Elantra just has a really nice interior. So I would go for the Elantra N with the manual transmission. I think the manual, you don't get the overboost mode. I think the Elantra doesn't you have, to have, have... Yeah, you have to have the... But I would still get the manual just because save the manual. So that would be my choice. All right, we're, we're getting down this list. We're at number two. Uh, you love the Lexus IS500. I'm going to disagree. I'm going to go with the LC500. Make your case for the IS500. Basically, they took an IS and shoehorned a big old V8. Yeah. So do you remember like the ISF? Yes. From like, I don't know, 10 years ago? Yep. That was a really cool car. Remember with the stacked dual tailpipes and then that went away. And they had the GSF, but then that kind of went away. And this, I think, is the last gasp of like cramming the biggest engine you can into the smallest Lexus vehicle. I loved it. On paper, not quite as competitive as like a BMW M3, not quite the same horsepower, but it's got a naturally aspirated V8, zero to 60 in 4.4 seconds. And this thing is an absolute screamer. But my favorite part is it's just so understated. This is gonna be like one of those cars we see on Bring a Trailer or Mecum in like 30 years, that you have to know what it is to understand why it's so valuable and it's the last of its breed. Very few people are gonna buy these, I think. I've never seen one, never seen one on the road, but it's a, just a phenomenal car, the IS500. Now the LC500 has been around a couple of years now, so that's not new, but what is new, and we drove this here, is the LC500 convertible. Uh, and I think they took the best looking car in the automotive world and made it even better by creating a convertible. Now you like the coupe better, I love the convertible. Uh, it speaks to me because I'm old, Tommy. <laughs> And there's something about like when you get older having a really sexy GT car where you picture like me and your mom uh, driving down PCH1 with the top down in this incredibly sexy car that just screams like uh, the French Riviera and all the good things in life uh, that, that there's something about that that just resonates with me. Um, I think uh, it's the car that is unheralded and it'll be one of those cars 50 years from now that people are going to be paying, you know, like, like, like kind of Ferrari money for. It's that beautiful, right? It's going to be like the GT250 uh, or the Daytona of, of our generation 50 years from now when everything's electric. And speaking of electric, let's go to number one. Number one, this is the best car I drove all year. Yep. Um, not this, this list wasn't really ordered except for number one, in my opinion. But it's the Hyundai Ioniq 5. So the Ioniq 5, and once again, there's been two Hyundais on the good list. This is not because they're paying us. I just think Hyundai has been absolutely killing it. Uh, but the Ioniq 5 is an all-electric, uh, they call it a crossover, but it's really a hatchback that looks like a 1980s Lancia Delta Integrale, feels and drives like a Mercedes E-Class, and is just the most retro, cool, great value vehicle I have driven all year. It is phenomenal. It's zero to 60 in about five seconds with all wheel drive. The range is in the mid 200 mile mark for that vehicle, up to 300 if you get the rear wheel drive. Starts at 40 grand. It's got a nap mode for the seats with a reclining function. It's got the full glass roof. It's got uh, a little front cubby in it. I just love it. It truly is a phenomenal car. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. It's also the car I think that takes it to Tesla. Uh, it sets the bar, you know, look, to me, a lot of electric cars have been like, the, uh, the, you know, the mach -E is Ford's version of uh, a, a Model Y, and the ID4 is Volkswagen's version of Model Y. This is uh, basically another level above Tesla at this point. Uh, not, not, not only is the car um, groundbreaking in its design and in its features, but it's also affordable, Tommy. You know, we had this conversation uh, a Model Y now is well into the 60s, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, How totally. much does a Hyundai Ioniq 5 start at? People didn't, when you, when you were in the program, you had this conversation with a lot of the other journalists that were there, and they didn't believe you when you said that it was going to start at what? Well, I thought it was going to start at about low 40s. Yeah. And I was pretty right. So standard range, rear wheel drive, 39.7 before the tax credit. So you can get up to $7,500 back, which you can't do on a Tesla. The build quality is better than the Tesla. If you get a higher end model with the, uh, like the drive assist, the, uh, the highway drive assist, I think is just as good, if not better than a Tesla. It truly is a phenomenal SUV. It doesn't feel like it's 
I mean, it doesn't feel like a Hyundai. It doesn't feel like a Mercedes. It doesn't feel like a Lex. I mean, it doesn't feel like any car on the road. It feels like something that is ground up fresh new in every way. It's so cool. I'm going to give a couple, before we get to the worst cars mm-hmm. we drove this year, I'm going to give a couple of special shout outs to cars that I recently drove because those are the ones that are fresh in my mind. Oh, yeah. Um, so I'm going to go with um, the Taycan. Uh, I just drove the Sports Turismo, which is the second best looking stage wagon. It's a very good looking stage wagon. Can you believe it's the second best? I think the Audi RS5 is better looking. We haven't driven it, so it's not on our list, but that's a gorgeous car. Oh, the RS6? The RS6, sorry. The RS6, yeah, the, the Avant. Uh, that, that's one that certainly would be on our list. Unfortunately, we haven't had a chance to drive it, so it can't be on our list. The other one that I would add to that is the uh, Boxer, uh, the, 7, the 718 uh, with the uh, 25 years. That's what they're calling it. Anniversary. I love that. The colors in that car. Boxster's Beautiful. pretty cool. 105000 A Very expensive. Get it? That's the one I would definitely get with the um, with the PDK. Uh, 400 horsepower. There's also the T-Rite, which is the smaller version of it with 300 horsepower. That's the one I get with the manual if you're out there shopping for a Boxer, if you can actually find one. Uh, and uh, a car that I fell in love with that I didn't think I would love, and once again, it's maybe because I'm old, uh, the S-Class. Just a regular S class, right? The not the not the EQS, but the traditional uh, S class, which uh, uh, was so comfortable and uh, so cushy that that I couldn't help but uh, but like have a huge smile every time I drove it. Now I'm gonna do. Can I do my first half of the Roman rant? Sure. The fr- I'll do the second half at the end of this uh, worst list. Mm-hmm. All right. I've been listening to a lot of podcasts, Tommy. Okay. And you know, I come from a broadcast. Uh, journalism background where um, you know, I went to graduate school for broadcast journalism. And I love all of your print reporters, but in print, like what's the worst thing you can do in print? Uh, mess up a semicolon? I don't know. No, misspell. There versus misspell, there. <laughs> misspell a word or a name, right? Okay. And yet now there's a lot of print guys and gals out there who are doing broadcast journalism, which is what this is, right? A podcast. And yet they're mispronouncing names of car companies and every time i hear it i want to pull my hair out and the worst one the worst offender on this one is is uh, the, is our number one car which is hyundai right it's not hyundai it's not hyundai it's not it's hyundai like sunday in america and it would be it, to get that wrong is like the equivalent of misspelling the name of the company and that's because while in korea it may be hyundai and in europe may be hyundai when the, the brand first came to America, the CEO of the brand at that time was asked, how do you pronounce Hyundai? And he said, it's Hyundai like Sunday. And so that's the correct way. The other one that even automotive journalists mispronounce is Porsche, right? It's not Porsche. I, I've heard people who should know better call it Porsche, but it's Porsche. And the Germans just, once again, go absolutely crazy when you mispronounce it. In Germany, it's P-O-R-S-C-H-E, and the E is not silent. You pronounce the E. That's what makes like German and I'm being Czech so easy to spell because you pronounce all the letters in the word. You don't like, there's no silent letters. But where does that stop? I mean, should we start saying Volkswagen instead of Volkswagen? Well, Andre says it the Russian way. Or, or should we start saying? He says, he says, he says instead of Volkswagen, instead of Volkswagen, he says W, right? He pronounces it like a W, I think. I think he pronounced it with an F. Does he pronounce it with an F? Yeah. So, so a W in German, a, a W is a V, right? So it is Volkswagen. Well, I mean, where does it end though? So like Porsche, right? Yeah. In Europe, it's Porsche. Um, but shouldn't we do the same with all the other German brands then? Shouldn't it be Mercedes instead of Mercedes? Shouldn't it be BMW instead of BMW? No, but you, look, oh, it's, it's, it's an interesting discussion. No, it's, no you're not. You're not like like deleting a letter, right? Porsche is you're completely forgetting that that e is at the end of that word. You do that with Chevrolet. I, 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 Chevrolet, but, but that's yeah, but that's an American oh, pronunciation. Like, I, it's I'll a give slippery you, slope. I'll, then I'll give you even a slipperier one. Mm-hmm. You know I'm Czech, right? Yeah. So how do you think you say the Czech car company? Yeah, I agree. It, it, so it's, the, the company we're talking about, if you're pronouncing it. The way you read it is Skoda, right? Right, S K O D A. Except in Czech, there's a little a hot check, which is a little check above the S, which turns the S into a sh. So the word is actually Skoda, which is also the word for shame in Czech. Yeah, it's a weird word, but I, that's what it means. Like it's a shame, right? Skoda, <laughs> not like shame, 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 but like it's a shame or it's unfortunate. So yeah, do you pronounce Skoda or Skoda? I, I think the people in the know say Skoda. The people who don't know say Skoda. It's a slippery slope because but it's not Skod. When you start getting to some of the weirder brands, even the PR folks have a hard time coming up with a straight like what? answer. What is the sporty Fiat called? Uh, the Quattrofolio? No, the the Fiat. 
I don't want to say. Oh, not Alfa Romeo. I don't want to. The sporty Fiat. You mean? Give I, me a, give I, do, me I know a, the word. I just don't want to like. Okay, but give me a bigger hint. You. Sporty Fiat. It's a 500. It's the one you love. You were looking for the convertible version. Uh, the starts, Fiat. starts with an A. A B A R T. A Barth. Mm. A Bart. Because I've heard it a Bart. Yeah. I've heard PR people say a Barth. Yeah. I've heard PR people say a Bart. A Barth. I've heard people. I heard people say EcoBoost and EcoBoost. Yeah, or EcoSport and EcoSport. I th- it's just it's a slippery slope. And I mean, then and then we got the worst one of all. Okay, what's that? So uh, FCA, right? Fiat right. Chrysler Automobiles. Right. Just Stellantis. merged with, yeah, yeah, with the French, Stellantis. Right. Yeah. And they, they're they bringing a car to SEMA, or I'm um, sorry. What's oh, the, the ME. The CES, yeah. the ME. Yeah. So here's a question. If we're going to start seeing that brand, who makes the ME? Oh, is it Citroën? Or all right. So yeah. in the UK, Citroen. in the UK, yeah. it's Citroën, right? right? Here in the U.S., if you're southern, it's Citron. If you're maybe a little bit more sophisticated, it's Citroen. Yep. Uh, not to say the southerners aren't sophisticated, but that's typically northern states say Citroen, southern states say Citron. And then the French would say Citroen. So where does... <laughs> you're just showing off your French now. <laughs> yeah, but where does the line stop? Is look, it Citroen, Citron, Citroen, or look, Citroen? Uh, you know where it stops? It's Hyundai like Sunday, guys. Just <laughs> Hyundai. Don't be high Hyundai. It's Hyundai like Sunday. It's Porsche. Just get those two right, and I'll be done. And All it's right. Mercedes and BMW. Just, just, just get those two slippery right. Slippery slope, Dad. All right. Worst cars of... Worst cars, most disappointing cars, Tommy. Number 10, VW Taos. It's the small little crossover. I agree. The little Taos, while it brings a lot of room to the segment, it also brings uh, a transmission and engine that don't really talk to each other. Oh, yes. Yeah. So it's got the seven speed DSG with the turbocharged engine, 158 horsepower. The numbers on paper are fine, but you get this horrible delay between when the clutch engages and when the turbo hits. And you get this kind of back and forth head toss that happens all the time trying to leave from a stop. I have this rule, and maybe you agree with me, maybe you don't. Hyundai has, and Kia have also broken this rule many times. I personally believe that small family-oriented vehicles, like crossovers, small sedans, should not have dual clutch transmissions. It works in like a high performance um, performance car, maybe supercar, right, For that's built for track use. But when you're sitting in traffic and you're just like waiting for the clutch to engage and it's, I mean, it shakes, it wobbles. They just don't feel good to me. Look, in, in the pantheon of transmissions, if it were my, if I were like the transmission god, I would say everything has to be manual. What? <laughs> I'm just saying for me, right? Unrealistic, for me, isn't it? All right. And then automatic is fine. Then dual clutch. And then... You know, CVT and somewhere in there, planetary gear set, I guess. But uh, that's just the way I would actually, um, you know, order uh, transmissions. But, look, I get that, for instance, uh, a dual clutch is great on track, but they're pretty miserable in traffic. Mm. Uh, and even the Germans are going away from them and going back to torque converters. Automatics pretty much work. And th- it, any, and they're not as good on track as a dual clutch, but they work off-road, they work on-road, they work in traffic. Manuals, of course, are the most engaging and fun to drive. Uh, and CVTs are just the devil's work. Mm, the devil's work. I'm telling you, it's the devil's work. Bold um, move there. Look, th- there's n- Except for a side-by-side CVTs have no reason to exist. If you are listening to this podcast, a lot of folks are going to agree with you. Yes. If you're my grandma who just bought a Hyundai Venue, you have no, you do not care at all. That thing could be powered by hamsters and and a rubber band, Look, and the, you wouldn't the, know. The upside to CVTs is they're supposed to be fuel efficient, but they're just miserable off road. They're oh my god. There's She's all, not taking well, her Venue off road. Let me ask you, what's what's even a worse worse usage of a CVT than off-road. There's one that's even worse. Worse than off-road? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Towing. Have you ever towed with a CVT? Look, oh, my God. I agree. It's From an enthusiast standpoint, from an off-road standpoint, from a towing standpoint, you're right. If you're just looking for the ultimate efficiency, who cares? Right? Get a manual. <laughs> the no, way it used to be back but in the good old days. Did you know, um, <laughs> if you look like side to side, a CVT will oftentimes be much more efficient uh, right, than a manual. Right, and, and hold up, yeah. it'll even be quicker about, to 60 than a manual. How about this? Get an electric car. <laughs> you won't have a transmission whatsoever. Did you know there was a company that experimented with putting a CVT with an electric car? That was an interesting idea. Oh, God. All right, let's keep going. I disagree with number nine. Hang on. The, the Taos, one last thing I want yeah. to say about the transmission. It's a little frustrating because if you get the front-wheel drive one, yeah. torque converter automatic. Yeah. It's just the all-wheel drive that yeah. gets the seven-speed DSG. All right, number nine, I put this on the list because I was totally bummed out by this car. The Urus? The that's w- a, that's Urus is like tripled the sales of Lamborghinis. It's the most popular Urus there, Lamborghini there is. It was the most expensive car I've ever been in that I'm, feels the least special. It feels like an Audi. I loved it, dude. I really thought it was great. I disagree. I love the Urus. It's got the fuel gauge from like 
a Volkswagen Atlas. I, I get that. You know? yeah, it I just, get that. It doesn't feel special. And I would go farther. I would say the Lamborghini STO, which I also drove, at least on track, was also one of the 10 best cars of the year. I love the fact that like Lamborghini actually doubled down uh, and made, you know, they had the Performante, which was like uh, a, a, a street car you could take on the track. I love that they actually built a track car you could take on the road with the STO, but I, I disagree. I thought the Urus was fun. Uh, you know, I'll give you one point. I'm sick of everybody having to build a crossover, right? So, like, all these brands that were representative of, like, Lamborghinis were, like, you know, supercars with two doors have now turned into crossover manufacturers, and that's kind of sad. Right, Ferrari's holding out, but I'm sure there's one coming. I think I know there's one coming. Uh, so in, in that regard, you know, yeah, okay, now Lamborghini has a crossover. So does Bentley. So does Porsche. Uh, but that's what people want, and at some point, the company has to build what people want. I feel like the selling point of a fast, look, like a supercar crossover, is that it should be insanely quick in a straight line, like quicker than any other crossover. But the issue is 0 to 62, 3.6 seconds, which is good on paper. But in practice, you have to wait for the turbos to build, and you're not in the right mode, and you don't have launch control engaged, so it doesn't feel that quick. Right. Whereas you buy like a Model X, right, Tesla Model X, you hit that gas, and you were doing 0 to 60 in 3 seconds or whatever, 2 seconds if you get the Plaid. So that's why I, uh, I, I definitely appreciate electric cars in terms of the hyper-performance crossover, and I think Lamborghini kind of missed the mark. Selling a boatload of them. Uh, they're selling a lot of them. Yeah, I, I, you're uh, right, right about I that. I agree on Polestar 2. We never drove the Polestar 1, which was this hybrid, uh, you know, very limited production kind of showcase car. So what happened with Polestar was Volvo. Uh, oh, there's so many issues here that we could talk about. But let me, let me kind of put it in a nutshell. Volvo spun off uh, the Polestar brand into its own company which I think created a lot of confusion out there because first and foremost, Polestar sounds like something a stripper would use, right? That's a problem, even though it's, <laughs> even though it's Volvo's performance brand. Secondly, uh, they decided and they announced that they were going to make it all electric, but yet the very first Polestar was a hybrid, which is weird. Uh, and thirdly, they decided that they would not have a dealer network, but would sell it kind of in pop-up stores and online and then have it be officially sold and serviced through Volvo dealerships. So I think there's just a lot of confusion. I suspect the upside to doing all that is that you get more tax credits. So basically, if Volvo runs out of tax credits, you know, that's a big incentive for people to buy Volvos. Uh, then you're kind of, you know, dead in the water. But if you spin off Polestar, you get a whole set of another tax credits, basically 250,000 cars, right? Uh, but the Polestar 2 as a car is um, just not... Um, just, just, just. It feels like it's. It feels like a kind of old tech already. The charging rate isn't all that grand. The range isn't all that grand. The interior is very Swedish, but it feels a little too minimalist. Uh, uh, they also decided to go, which is baffling to me. Once again, like like every decision I would make, they made the exact opposite one. So instead of having a, a two wheel drive car that is rear wheel drive where the front wheels do the driving and the rear wheels do the pushing they went to a front wheel drive configuration uh for the two wheel drive yeah, which point. is also weird and they could have gone I, I i just don't understand it uh i, I you know I, I i don't know you know i think I, it I, well what i will say it's a lot of questions it looks quite good the design is quite good the design is okay i think the, it's a little bit anonymous the interior feels very small very very tight yeah um almost a little bit too small for the for the size of the vehicle i, I in my opinion uh if you get like the all-wheel drive one, 260 some miles of range, but we're looking at like 51 grand. Before tax credit, you can't get the tax credit, which is good. But quite honestly, I think they have done such a bad job communicating on where and how and like where you can buy these things. I mean, it is my job to know this, and I've talked to many people in the industry, and I've gotten like 13 different answers. Every journalist has a different answer, and I just cannot get a straight answer on how and where you buy one, because you can't buy one at a Volvo dealer, can you fix it at a Volvo dealer? Yeah, you can. You can at every Volvo dealer? I don't know. I don't That's know. my question. Can you buy it in every state? Where Where do you take delivery of it? How do you take delivery of it? The other problem, the problem with the Polestar is the recharge, which is the same chassis, right? The Volvo recharge. Which, which is, is a Volvo. Which is a Volvo, and it's a very good-looking Volvo, and it's the same basic chassis as a Polestar 2. And then here's the worst part, yeah. right? So my friend asked me, what would what, you buy with your new electric car? Oh, I got a Polestar. And they're like, what's a Polestar? I'm like, well, it's kind of like a Volvo. So it started as a performance tuning company within Volvo, um, and then they built some hot Volvos, and then they spun off, and then they built this weird supercar electric gas thing, and then that died, and now they're building full electrics. So you bought a Volvo? No, it's a Polestar. It's that, like, what? 
I don't I do not get this car at all, Dad. I really don't understand it. Yeah, it, the messaging is not grand. It's not. They've not done a good job from a marketing standpoint communicating what it is. You are a thousand percent right there. So should we move on to number seven? Yeah, the Mitsubishi Eclipse Cross. Uh, what don't you like about that? I... Uh, I want to like this car a lot because Mitsubishi has such a heritage of rally, such a heritage of performance, and um, the Dakar wins with the old Pajeros. Uh, they brought the Monteros into the States. They were fantastic. But we drove this vehicle, um, the, the quick one with all the options, and it felt like the interior was from late 90s. Like, it just did not feel very premium for the price. It did not perform up to my standards. It had a CVT, which I do have an issue with, with performance oriented vehicles the one we drove had the turbo engine yeah it feels like it feels like old tech uh, and it feels like a rental car this is what i did not want and to i hate to say that because i like the brand and i you know at one point mitsubishi built some of the most innovative some of the coolest some of the craziest cars out there whether it's from an off-road point of view or a tech point of view uh, and then it just kind of ugh. the one we drove i think was over 31 grand yeah and it just did like this is what i was worried would happen with the gti Right, the Eclipse name was always been synonymous with maybe not a high performance car, but a cool looking low to the ground coupe. And they applied it to a fairly cool looking but high riding crossover thing. And it just does not work for me. I think the front end restyles a little weird for the new new 2022 model year. Um, I don't know, Dad. I just think there are better options out there if you want a smallish crossover. All right, number six, that's an interesting choice because I think uh, that's gonna be very controversial. A lot of people <clears throat> love this car. You've put the Jeep Grand Wagoneer. Yes. So that is, of course, uh, there are some issues with the Grand Wagoneer. I'll give you that. Uh, the biggest issue, of course, is that it's a three-row, uh, which also competes with the Jeep uh, Grand Cherokee L. So they've got a little bit of mixed messaging going on there. But Jeep would say that, uh, and there's no Jeep badging on it for the most part. I think there's like three, right? There's one in the light that says Jeep. There's one in the rear view mirror, and there's one in the taillight that says Jeep. But everywhere else, it says Grand Wagoneer. We have one now at the office. Uh, we just did a video with it. Uh, Nathan's actually doing a review. My issue with the Grand Wagoneer uh, is uh, that uh, I don't like I don't like the design of it. If I'm being honest, I just think it's too slab sided, uh, and outside of like that seven sided grill, it doesn't like it doesn't like speak to me in terms of like looks. I just but I I, had, I borrowed one from Jeep when I was in Arizona, and every guy like that was probably you know 10 or 20 years older than me walked up to me and was like, what the hell is that? That is just beautiful. So maybe maybe it's just, I'm not that old yet. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Ouch, okay, that's horrible. That is pretty bad, <laughs> bad review you just gave it there. I, I, well, this is what happened. <laughs> not these, all that these old, old dudes, I came up and like, like the, you know, like, like they've gone like, I mean, they're competing with Navigator, with Escalade. Right, but it feels uh, like luxury for the sake of luxury. Look, but it doesn't feel modern or cool or uh, like it just it feels stodgy in the, some ways. The first issue I, I completely agree with is the design. It's it's got the body colored B, C, and D pillar, which yeah. kind of make it look like an airport shuttle. It's yeah. just so long. There's so many body color pillars and it accentuates the windows and there's a lot of windows and it just looks like too many windows. So first issue with it. Then you've got just the, the awkward proportions of the gap between the top of the wheel arch to the hood is too big. The overhangs are too long. I, just the design doesn't work for me. I agree with you 100%. And then we get to once again the branding. So like you mentioned, you got the Grand Cherokee L three row crossover SUV. You've got the standard Wagoneer, starts in the 50, high 50s, right? right? That's a body on frame three row SUV. And then you got the Grand Wagoneer, which is similar to the Wagoneer, but more expensive. Starts at 88,000, Series 3 will go well into what, 110, 112. And then you got, the, you, got the, you got the Equus problem, which is what you talked about. We've talked to Jeep dealers, we've talked to Jeep themselves, and on the press launch like that Andre went to, they do not want you to refer to this as a Jeep. They want you to refer to it as a Grand Wagoneer. And, and you see that on the vehicle, it doesn't have Jeep on the hood, it doesn't have Jeep on the steering wheel, it doesn't have Jeep on the back, it says Grand Wagoneer everywhere. But you still buy it next to a $21,000 Renegade. You still service it next to a $25,000 Compass, right? That, like the Equus was Hyundai's first attempt here in the US, the ultra luxury luxury car. But the issue with the Equus was you were buying it next to an Elantra. So I, I think I figured out what my biggest issue while you were talking, right? And I'll give you a contrast to it. So the issue I have with that vehicle is like they haven't refined what like like what off-road American luxury should be. They tripled down on traditional luxury mm, good point. That, that that made American cars luxurious. So tons of leather, tons of technology, wood, air lots suspension, of wood. lots Don't of wood. Don't forget the wood. Right. It's, it's you know the Macintosh system which looks like something out of a rock concert. The the you know what I mean? Even the way the Macintosh is written. Now contrast that with the new Defender. Right, which is um, um, you know 
very simplistic design, right? A lot of like open, airy feel to it. Materials that are recyclable or are non-leather, mm. uh, and you know, exposed screws, which kind of give you that off-road feel. I, I, I think modern luxury, to me, uh, is the exact opposite of what traditional luxury is, right? Like when I think of a Grand Wagoneer, I think of like a like a dude with a giant ice cube in one of those rock glasses with a glass of whiskey and a cigar. Uh, and that to me is not like like what I think of, of of what luxury should be. I wanna I wanna see like 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 I said, non maybe vegan materials. And I know that you know, this is yuppie, I, I can already see the comments, right? <laughs> right? But but that that to me is where the world is going as opposed to where the world has been. You know, I'm fine with them trying to compete where the world has been. Because this is clearly targeting Escalade, right? This is clearly targeting Lincoln Navigator. Right. But I personally believe when you were shopping in this class, the brand and what it says about you is a really big deal, right? You buy a $115,000 Escalade, you bought the Ultimate Cadillac. You buy a $115,000 Navigator, you bought a, you bought a Navi, right? You bought a Navigator. You spend one hundred and fifty grand. You, you spent it on a, on a Jeep. Like that that's just it's a hard thing to get past. Well having said that, it tows a lot, Tommy. Oh yeah, it's got a massive V eight, six point four liter. Sounds pretty cool. Yeah, it's got it's, it's got very a, comfortable. Very comfortable ride. Yep. It's super floaty. Uh but like I say, it it to me is is you know the wrong kind of luxury. Maybe that's why. why. And they don't do a trail hop version, so And they don't do a trail hop. That's version. where we're at. All right, number five, you put the uh, Ford Mustang Mach E. I crossed it out and put the VW ID four. I, I was just disappointed. <laughs> I think the Ford Mustang Cross it out my list here. I just the Mustang Mach Mach-E is fine. A lot of our friends, Sofian has one, Alex has one. Uh, you know, I could say it's Ford's version of... Well, they have the G... Al- Sofian has a GT, though. And I haven't driven the GT. Maybe that's phenomenal. The GT. Uh, you know, it was fine. I, 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 I have a hard time getting over the fact that it's a Mustang. I, you know, call it the Galaxy. That would be great. We've said that before. Look, I, I know it's like it's getting cliche to say, oh, it's not a Mustang. But the issue is... Every Mustang I've driven, it can be a 10-year-old V6 Mustang, right? And you get in it, and it feels special. You're sitting low. You look back. You got that fastback design. There's two doors. It's cozy. It's like, this is special. Even a base four-cylinder EcoBoost. But you get in the Mach-E, and it's like, it just it feels like a crossover. Yes, it has the slanting roof line, but if you look closely, it's faked, right? It's got the body color roof line, and then it's got a flat black roof line that's more stiff on top. It's a, it's a good car. You are 100% right that I don't mean to say it's a bad car. It just doesn't feel as special, even in the base trims that I'd expect it to be. Yeah, and for me, the W the ID4, it's, once again, it's a fine car. You know, it's right down the middle. But I like cars that are, have personality. And I can't get past the fact that they only have two buttons for the windows, even though there are four buttons. It's just so <laughs> aggravating. It's personality. And yeah, that's that's the kind of personality that aggravates the, you know, what out of me. You hit that little, like, switch that toggles it from the front to the rear button by accident, and you stop it at a, a toll booth plaza and all of a sudden you open the window and it opens up the rear window because you accidentally toggle it to the rear. It's just, it's just really stupid cost cutting or just stupid design. Well, that's another one of the Volkswagen products that has the infuriating infotainment system that I just we, can't. We just talked about it. I, I just can't there. deal with. Yeah. But um, yeah, the, there's a way you can put down all four windows too, I think, and with one <laughs> click. Great. But why are we Double click that? the little toggle You're switch. Right. <laughs> um, one more thing I want to say about the, the Ford and one of the reasons it's on my list is it has a very disappointing charging curve. Right when you look at the fast charging curve, it's very much artificial, and then it pretty much just dies at 80%. So I think that's something they need to work on. But um, I'm glad that we're seeing some more electric cars ground up EVs I, from I, these major OEMs. I, outside of the in this segment, okay, yep. in this segment right now, outside of the Hyundai Ioniq 5, I am just bored to death of electric mid-size crossovers. <laughs> Give me anything else, any anything else at this point. A convertible, a sports car, a truck, a trucklet, a big SUV. Uh, a, a really big SUV. A big SUV. A really tiny car. A really tiny, just anything but a mid-sized electric a crossover. Van. How about a minivan? Uh, how about a minivan? How about anything else, manufacturers? Just knock it off with the mid-sized crossover. I don't care. I'm bored. It's just, it's just like you know what it is. I, I think Top Gear did this once. Like, like they couldn't tell the difference between. I'm serious. You, you line up like ten mid-sized crossovers from the back. You can't tell the difference between them, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, be it uh, a CRV, be it. Uh, uh, a RAV4, be it you know any of the Koreans, they're all the same. I feel the same thing about electric crossovers at this point. Just knock it off already. Just give me something more interesting. All right, let's go to number four, Lexus UX. Once again, not a bad car. It's Too just, small. Well, <laughs> it's just too freaking small. It's just not enough interior a, room. Someone who drives a Mini Cooper. <laughs> 
<laughs> Mini Cooper like, has personality. This thing is just one size too small. It, yeah, it's just it's, it's like not, they're trying to bring luxury to I the don't know. to the and it's not you know the cool thing about once again a small crossover is that at some point it's got to be practical. It is very small. You're the right. The Corolla Cross is practical. Right. Right. It's small, but it's got room. Like, you could throw a bike on it. This thing, I don't know if you could even throw a bike. The UX, it's, Maybe just, on it, not it's in it. just trying to be too many things to everybody. And it just, I mean, it's got, like, the big plastic wheel arches, which kind of shows that it's off-roady. But then, it is I mean, the driving dynamic and the design is supposed to say it's more sporty. It didn't ride particularly well. It certainly wasn't quick. I felt it was pretty pokey um, from 0 to 60. The hybrid is sort of efficient, but the all-wheel drive system is kind of disappointing with that disconnectable rear motor. It's just, it's not my, my favorite. Favorite Lexus. If you're going to get a Lexus, I think the RX is probably the best SUV they build. The NX is okay as well, especially with the turbo. But the UX, it, it just doesn't doesn't fit many of my my good good like criteria. All right, number three. Now think about this. Number three, and I'll give you the perfect world, Tommy. That would have been just blown my mind. Mm -hmm. In the perfect world, Volkswagen would have kept the GTI a gas. Okay. But they would have made the Golf R all electric. Ooh, that's an interesting idea. Would, wouldn't that have been something, huh? So here is why my Golf the Golf R is on my disappointing list this year. Because it's not electric. <laughs> no, it's that when I was growing up, right, yeah. and when I saw like the the, the Mark Five and the Mark Six Golf Rs. At the time, those were insane performance for not a lot of money. They were incredible zero to 60, and they didn't cost that much relative to like uh, performance car money. And fast forward to the 2022 model. Oops, you gotta get your, we oh. lost our, yep. our Jeep, there we go. Yeah, the, the picture in the background. Yep. Fast forward to the 2022 model, it's some $13,000 more than the GTI. Which is fine if it was like an absolute screamer in a straight line. And it just doesn't perform as well as I think it should. 315 horsepower, like that's a lot of horsepower. But for 44 grand, I don't know. It just didn't feel that special. The Golf R has always been like the halo um, hot hatch in my mind. And this one just doesn't kind of live up to the new crop of electrics that are coming in that give you affordable performance in a straight line. So before I discuss that, you know what we should do on that computer? Stop it from going to sleep. What? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I apologize. Our, our background computer keeps going to sleep. Yeah, we'll change that setting. Uh, all right, let's talk about the uh, Golf R. You know, it's one of my favorite cars. I've always dreamed of owning it. Uh, it's, you know, all-wheel drive, which is perfect for Colorado and the snow. It's one of those cars that could be your only car. It could be your sports hmm. car. It could be your, you know, around town car. It could be your family hauling car. It could be your um, road trip car. That's what I love about it. Uh, but once again, for me, as much as I love the driving dynamics of the car, we drove it once again out with the with the GTI. The infotainment system is going to keep me from buying it. I know this sounds goofy because cars aren't about infotainment, but yeah, they kind of are. You know, the infotainment has become uh, probably the most important single aspect of what a vehicle is now. And I hate to say it because in my heart says it should be the powertrain or it should be the, you know, the handling dynamics, but inf infotainment, it's what it's about nowadays, right? People just live online uh, uh, and the cars become a reflection of that. And unfortunately, the, the current version, maybe Volkswagen will do something like over their updates where they'll make it more intuitive. But uh, at some point when it becomes frustrating uh, and uh, painful in some ways to use, you just want to just, just even, even though the car itself is a hoot, you just want to be like, I can't deal with this. Uh, the Golf R launched several years ago in the seventh generation, right? And it had almost 300 horsepower. The new one, 315, excuse me. So it's a little better, but it's just not the, the supercar beater that I, I... Maybe I was wrong and then I used to manage, imagine it that way, but I'd like to see a little bit more out of that vehicle. At least 0 to 60, which is kind of the standpoint that I always held that car okay, to. So, so number two, what do you have against the Mercedes A35? Oh, what do I have against the Mercedes A35? Because I love, the, I love the GLB, Tommy. Remember how I said I didn't like dual clutch automatics yeah this is i think the single worst dual clutch automatic i've ever driven i it, it would be hard to find a car that's think it, is the glb have the same one it must have this mm, yeah but I, I mean it's so the glb the one we had was the little 250 yeah it was not tuned for performance right it was just a little runabout mm -hmm. suv the a35 it was quick when you were on it right yep. it's an amg car but seriously the the transmission programming and dynamics in the city were almost nauseating especially with the high power that would hit out of that turbo. I mean, you drove it with me and you're like, why are you driving like such a tool right now? I'm like, I am not trying to, I'm trying to drive it smoothly. But the combination of the dual clutch, the aggressive shifting and the turbocharged four cylinder just makes it almost impossible to drive smoothly. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it's a beautiful car. I mean, from the outside, you look at that. Wasn't ours yellow? Wasn't it like that hot yellow? Well, so we had, I think an A45, which was yeah. yellow. Okay. That one, I kind of, 
I liked a little bit more because that one was just so balls off the wall. Like yeah. I kind of look past it. The A35 was trying to be a little bit more affordable, a little bit more daily drivable, and it just did not accomplish that. So I I did not appreciate the uh, the transmission, and that's why that's like the only reason it's on my list. Because I agree, it's a good looking car, it's pretty quick, but value wise and just the jerkiness was miserable. All right, and number one, I uh, haven't driven this, but uh, I had big hopes for this car. Yes. And apparently they did not materialize because initially when it was um, announced, it was um, kind of like the uh, i3, right? It was uh, it was a range-extended uh, plug-in hybrid with a range extender, which was a rotary-powered mm. range extender, which was cool. But, of course, we're talking about the new Mazda MX-30. Uh, and when it came to America, it lost the rotary engine, which is the magic of that car but the design is cool what's wrong with the mx30 it's it's a all electric uh hatchback mazda so yes it's a vehicle based on the cx30 so it's okay. kind of small little crossover and there is a lot to like it's got one of the coolest interiors uh, on the market today with this cork material really funky seat materials beautiful design beautifully well made i love the interior exterior is also funky it's got um, those little uh, clamshell rear doors right it's just such a cool car to look at two-tone roof uh, is available and it's nice to drive. Mazda knows how to dial in a chassis to be in some of the best in the industry. But the MX-30, like you mentioned that when it came to the US, only came as a full electric, as a battery electric vehicle, BEV. And what that meant is that the range was pretty limited because um, in other markets, it is a plug-in hybrid. However, here in the US, we're looking at a vehicle that starts $36,000 before tax incentives, but still mid $30,000 car with a range of just about 100 miles. And that is just not good enough, um, especially for 2022. Uh, and there's, there's some other things you can gripe about, like it is a little bit slow for a, a battery electric. It doesn't have a front trunk and it's front wheel drive, right? All things that are a little bit frustrating, but it's just that range number. Because apart from the, the range number, and the charging is a little disappointing too, but apart from the range and the charging, which is a big deal on electric, it's a fantastic car to look at. It drives brilliantly, the technology is good. Um, and I, I love it. I think it's a really funky little thing. Wow. That, uh, I think, sums it up. Like I said, I didn't drive it myself, so I, I can't comment on it. I, I, mean, I, I know a lot of people have, have kind of pegged that up on the wall and have used it as, uh, you know, taking shots at it, literally and figuratively, because it doesn't have enough range. It doesn't have enough battery. It doesn't charge quick enough. It feels like a car that, uh, you know, should have been introduced. But you could say that a lot, you know, honorable mentions, I think. The, we haven't even driven these well, cars. Well, hold up. The weird, one more thing I want to say, because yeah. I know we're going to get comments. The reason that the Mini Cooper with 114 miles of range was on our best list and the Mazda with 100 miles of range was on one of our, our disappointing lists yeah. is because of the class of car that they target, right? The Mini is a little itty bitty teeny weeny city commuter, right? You're not going to be able to put family or friends in the back seat because it's tiny. Now, the Mazda does have the potential to be a more than a city commuter, right? It's got back seats. It's got um, a, a trunk that's usable. It's got a higher ride height so you can see over traffic that might be good on a highway, but it just doesn't have the range. And they do have this weird program too, which I think is going to be problematic, where if you want to take longer trips, they will lend you your dealer apparently will lend you oh, that's gonna work a like gas a car. Yeah. yeah, exactly. This market to take on your your seven day road trip. Um, but yeah, there's there's if they had put that little rotary range extender, ninety eight percent of this car's problems would be fixed immediately. Right? You could run it on electricity for your commute, drive it on gas for their trips. But they didn't do that, and that's why it's on the list. Uh, fair enough, dude. What um, are your honorary mentions? I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, my honorary mentions I just completely forgot about. Um, I know. I just steamrolled you. you I yeah, apologize. It kind of went through uh, a lot of... Let me... Let me uh, let me look. Let me let me look through my memory banks. So, what did you think about like one of our long-term cars? We had the 2021 um, Subaru Crosstrek this year. Um, that was actually uh, the, the second part of my rant. Oh, now that you remember, I said I, I had I had two rants that I was I was working on, and I said I'll give you the first part. So, uh, I actually, you know, we bought our Crosstrek uh, for twenty. Three. Yeah, twenty three thousand five hundred. Mm -hmm. Pretty uh, good value. Pr pretty good value. Yeah, uh, and uh, uh, I thought for that much money, it was um, really wonderful uh, in terms of the value you got and the amount of space and the amount of like fuel economy you got for mm -hmm. it. Uh, having said that, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think it's a it's an off roader per se. No, and there's different kinds of off roaders, right? I mean, you know, we live in Colorado, so. 
I guess if you're in Chicago and your off-road idea of off-roading is a dirt road, then it's fine. Uh, but as an off-roader that, that we would consider an off-roader in Colorado, it isn't fine. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, but I, I think... I, I think for 23.5, it's, it's a hell of a bargain. I agree that they do market it as more off-road worthy than it is. That's the problem. But I don't think a lot of people are trying to take this into Wrangler stuff. I, I think we have to mention that as well. I, I like it a lot. Great value. It was reliable over the, the months that we had it. Pretty, uh, pretty, pretty decent all-wheel drive system for street-going stuff. I think that was good. Um, so other things I want to discuss, a car I loved and you really didn't like, mm-hmm. the new BMW M3. Yeah, the seats were uh, uh, <laughs> we did a, torture, the, uh, a torture device. We did have the sports seats, which yeah. give you an interesting feature where they stab your lower groin <laughs> when you sit in it. And if you're anything over, what am I, 140 pounds, they're going to be terrible. But if you are 140 pounds, they are phenomenal. They are like ultimate race carbon buckets. And I thought they were fantastic. Plus, they were yellow and like bright blue. And it just so, like, so, I loved it. I thought it was so cool. So could I, could I, could I, could I get to, to, to my other rant? Sure. All right. My other rant is, and this is this is actually you just you just brought it up. Uh, I wish Bucket car manu- I wish car manufacturers would not forget about us big guys, right? Hmm. Uh, I love Paul. You know who is probably what? Um, you know, 150 pounds lighter than me. Yep. At least, right? <laughs> I don't think you're being a little harsh on yourself. I don't think he's 150 pounds. <laughs> but but anyway, you. you know what I mean? He, he is a definition of, of a race car driver, right? Uh, a very spry, very uh, agile, very small person that, that, you know, just takes a car by the scruff. Uh, but if you're a big guy like me, uh, I am I am just, just tired of having cars that don't fit me. And I, I'll give you a list of cars that I don't fit in, okay? And, and, and I wonder to <laughs> myself, got a like, list? like I, got a, I have a list, and I wonder to myself, like, <laughs> Why wouldn't you make the car like an inch bigger so that big people can actually fit in them so that big people can afford to buy them, okay. right? So I'll, I'll give you a list. So number one, of course, is the Miata. Right out. I, I can't get that seat far enough back. Oh, that's right. a slippery slope, though, too, because you make that bigger, and then it gets heavier, and then you got to put a bigger yeah, engine in it, and then bam. One, one inch, Tommy. No, it's never an inch. Because um, what as women will tell you, it's never an inch. You know, it's oh. always turns out to be more, and then you end up with a car that really is a Mustang convertible. Because no, oh, no, well, just, we're making it an inch look, bigger. Give like it the, a back seat. The oh, we give it a back seat. Give the, it a real back seat. The second I put the top up, I'm looking into the top of the A pillar, or you know, the top no. of the frame, and I can't see. Cross that one right off. So Miata, that, that Miata, one is incorrect. Miata, like, you, like, forget it. No big guys buying that. Stay small. Okay, number one, Miata. Number two, uh, BRZ or eighty-six. Same problem. Once again, don't Once make it too big. Same, same problem. I can't comfortably get in there. And, and let's say if me and you are in it, oh or, or if me and Nathan are in it, we, we shoulder room is so bad that me and Nathan are like like best buddies in terms of shoulder. Just you know, give us a little bit of room so that we can actually like reach over and grab our wallet when we're paying for the number nine McDonald's meal. <laughs> These are these are both terrible choices. Right. These are both cars that need to remain small. N- n- number Every, three, the one that on, really one, one more thing. Yeah. Every car now has gotten huge. Let's leave the enthusiast cars tiny. N- n- number three, the other one that I hate: Toyota Supra. Do not fit in the Toyota Supra. Hit my head hits. I do not fit in the Toyota Supra. That is a car that I, I, I you know, I have dreamed about. I would love to drive. Do not fit in the Toyota. Why Supra. don't we pick some cars that Look, should the, be more comfortable? Let me ask you this, Tommy. We have a Mia Mini SE, right? Uh-huh. This is a car that is smaller than a Miata, and yet right. I fit comfortably in it. It's also nine feet tall. I mean, it's not exactly a low ground hugging sports car. Like I think that any there's... truck is incredible. I'll give you one. Any truck I fit into. Yes, because that's the size of Nebraska. <sighs> there, the one car. Even the, even, you know, the Maverick. The Maverick I fit into. It's a compact truck, and I fit into it but like a dream. But once again, it's a truck. Right? It's not supposed to be tiny. A sports For car... For a truck, is, it's tiny. No, a sports car needs to be lightweight and nimble. Can I give you a good one? Here's yeah. a good one. Uh, the Jaguar F-Type. Okay. It's a Grand Tour. There's no reason it needs to be so small. They think the seats are terrible in the F-Type, and they need to make them better for, for taller folks. That is one I'll give you. Um, another one I'll give you, which, granted, is still sporty, but the Civic Type R, the seats are unusable. That was, the, that was next on my yeah. Civic Type it's R. It's unusable for tall folks. Civic Type R, unusable. Absolutely can't, can't drive. And, it's, it, and you'll look, a lot of these cars, or actually all of them, are Japanese. Yeah. I think it's cultural. I think in, in general, and I don't want to stereotype, so I don't know, but in general, I think if you look the at the F-type numbers, isn't Japanese. the Japanese are shorter. 
harder than Americans, right? If you look at statistically, yeah. right? And I think because of that, they probably build cars more in line with you know the people they're selling them to. But we don't fit. F Type isn't Jeff. That's, that's no, UK. No. I, yeah, but but I'm saying Civic Type R is another one. Mm. Absolutely. I, in line. I'll give you the Civic. And then there are certain seat brands. And, the, and the, yeah, and then the problem. Yeah, Recaro is number one. Yeah. So like the Ford Recaro seats. The Ford Recaro seats in the in the uh, Raptor or also the, miserable. Or like the Fiat. Remember the old Fiesta Recaro seats? Yes. I don't know who they designed those for, but it's not a human. Um, but luckily on those models, you can get like the standard seats and it's fine. I think the Mustang, like the GT350 also had that so situation. So the, the sports seat is in the uh, Porsche GTS. The, yep. the, is, is kind of like you could like live in it for a little bit as a big guy. But once again, you know, uh, Paul would be like like loving that seat. And I'm it's, an, it's a medieval torture device, especially the one in the M3 as well. Uh, and I, I get that the manufacturers out there trying to prove this is a hardcore sports car made for enthusiasts, and I, I can see the commercial, like you know, like like very thin, uh, skinny jeans, you know, wearing, um, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, lemon lime spritzer drinking, you know, guys, <laughs> right, with, with Ray Bans <laughs> driving these things. But the fact is, you're not selling them to those guys. You're selling them to me, and I, I cannot buy that car given those seats. Well, yeah, you'd buy a Silverado. That, that's exactly <laughs> what happens. You're, you're exactly right. Oh, jeez. Yeah. I, I will say I think the worst seat award goes to, and I hate to say this because I own one, but the, the Wrangler seats are especially bad. The Wrangler seats are also they problematic. They are really bad. Yeah. Even if you get an $80,000 392, they don't go back far enough, and there's just no support anywhere. Um, but that's not because it's for small people. That's just because I think it's not a very good seat. And I think I think that's why mid-sized crossovers are so popular. Yeah, because they're, they're roomy. Just, they're easy to get they're in and out of. Put the dog in the back, yeah, the kids yeah. in the back. The the reason mid-sized crossovers are so popular is because they're like the safe choice. You know, they're unoffensive. They'll do what you need them to do. Um, they're typically very reliable. It's like the the dishwasher choice of the automotive brand. And and they sell huge numbers. Look how many Rav fours they sell. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands. So it makes sense why OEMs are, are building electric versions and, and hybrid versions and fast versions because those statistically are the cars that sell. But of course, from an enthusiast, we want more Miatas and BRZs and that kind of thing. So for all of you big guys out there, let me know uh, in the comments below. I'd love to hear what other cars that you don't fit into uh, and that you would love to fit into and you would love to buy if they made them just an inch or two bigger. Uh, and if you're looking for all of our TFL content, stories, TikToks, videos. Just go to tfl-studios.com where we have everything in one place. It's one shop stopping. Uh, and Tommy, Happy New Year to you, dude. Happy New Year to you too, Dad, and everybody listening yeah. and watching. We'll see you next time. Yeah, Happy New Year. Ciao.